now we should be recording um and people will probably drop in during in the, in the beginning here but um just to to start so i would like to introduce to you emma beezer who's uh, a, a great stellar astrophysicist and i'm really happy that she could come and join us and give the colloquium today so um emma did her phd in liverpool in uh, uk and she's been working on, on red supergiants and, and uh, massive red supergiants, of course. And that's something that is um, not super common, I would say, in the massive star community, but really, really needed. And so Emma has a lot of research on um, uh, mass loss and the evolution of red supergiants to, to collapse, etc. And currently, Emma is a, is a Hubble Fellow at the Noir Lab in Tucson. Um, and has done some really fun new things um, concerning the red supergiants, and I hope that she will share with us today. So, um, with that, Emma, if you could start to show uh, share your screen um, and just get started when you feel like. Great. Uh, thank you for that intro. Oh, God, what's happening? Uh, so, I'm just going to turn my video off because uh, I don't have very good signal here, but let me know when you can see. Is that all good? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, so thanks so much for inviting me to give this talk today. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and thanks, Elva, for the really nice introduction. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the mass loss rates of red supergiants and why that is important. So a bit of background, uh, why red super, where, what red supergiants are. They are evolved massive stars with initial masses between 8 to 25, 8 to 30 solar masses, um, depending on the models you look at. Um, and they sit in the top right hand corner of the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. They're really bright and really cool. Uh, famous examples include uh, Betelgeuse and VY Canis Majoris. Um, and they're the direct progenitors to type two supernovae. And knowing which red supergiants are exploding and which ones aren't exploding uh, provides us with a very powerful test of stellar evolutionary theory. So a standard 15 solar mass of a mid range uh, red supergiant will spend most of its time on the main sequence, burning hydrogen in its core. And um, when the core runs out of hydrogen, the star cools and moves to the right of the HR diagram. And it's now burning helium in its core, but there's still a hydrogen burning shell around the core. Um, and, this, and at this point, the H-rich envelope um, swells up. So the core contracts and the envelope swells. So you end up with a really extended um, atmosphere. And on the HR diagram, uh, this looks pretty simple. The objects, the stars leave the main sequence and travel pretty much directly to uh, the red supergiant phase. Um, and when they reach the red supergiant phase, this might very well be the last phase that they live through. So once the star is in the red supergiant phase, it's now on its path to supernovae. Um, and you end up with an onion-like structure in the core. So a very, very basic view of the end. Um, everything fuses into heavier and heavier elements um, until eventually the core fuses to iron. And at this point, because it's an endothermic reaction, there's no more um, energy being given out. So there's nothing supporting the star against its own gravity. And the outer layers of the star come crashing down onto the core. And it's at this point that we get our core collapse supernovae. Um, and the question of which kind of supernova you get depends on very much on the appearance of a progenitor at core collapse. Um, so it's not actually that simple. The type of supernova you see depends directly on how much of the hydrogen envelope is left around the star at the time of the explosion. Um, and red supergiants have winds across the surface that can peel away the envelope. Um, and the red supergiant phase is about 1 million years, and the massless time scale can be about the same. So technically, you could peel away the entire envelope of the star um, throughout the red supergiant phase. But there is mass loss uh, throughout the entire evolution of the star. Um, and the way it's implemented in stellar models, there is a hot phase and a cool phase. So in the main sequence for stars in this mass range, the mass loss rate is pretty low. Um, so the only time we should really be interested in the cool supergiant mass loss or the, the mass loss of these stars is when it's strong enough to remove the envelope, but it doesn't happen in the main sequence that puts a lot of emphasis on the cooler phases. Uh, so the standard picture for a uh, star less than 30 solar masses is that the star leaves the main sequence, 
um, and will travel across to the right hand side of the Hertz and Russell diagram and die as a type 2 supernovae or a hydrogen rich supernovae. For stars above this mass, um, they might not even ever get to the red supergiant phase because the mass loss rates are stronger and they'll die the stripped type supernovae. Um, but there could be another route that's been suggested and this is perhaps if mass loss rates are really, really high in the cool or the red supergiant phases, then you might end up with a lower mass red supergiant that um, reaches the red supergiant phase and then undergoes a lot of mass loss and potentially makes a different type of supernovae. So the amount of hydrogen you have, as I said, um, makes a big difference on the type of supernova you see. So if the star manages to hold on to its envelope, you see hydrogen rich supernova or type two. Um, and if it loses its envelope through the stellar winds or by some other mechanism, um, then the star will evolve back to the hot side of the HR and die as a hydrogen poor supernovae. But we do know that um, red supergiants do explode as supernovae um, because of the amount of Hubble imaging that's available, archival imaging. When a supernova goes off, um, if it's in a well-imaged galaxy, you can directly identify a progenitor. Um, so this is a particularly nice example. So you can see in the middle, um, you've got your supernova and you go uh, back through your archival imaging and see if it's been imaged before. And you can see on the left, there is a red star, which is a red supergiant. And then what you can do is you can wait for the supernova to fade away and look back. And if your progenitor star is gone, then you can say that that was the uh, progenitor star. Um, and if you're lucky, you might have observations of the progenitor in a few wave bands. And this means you can get a pretty good idea of what the progenitor looked like. Um, so this one is, is clearly red, but more than likely, you probably don't have that much to go off. Um, sometimes it's just upper limits or just observations in one wave band. But we can still learn about the progenitor using that um, whatever photometry is available. Um, you have to make some assumptions, for example, about the temperature of the star, the distance to the star, um, and you can determine a final luminosity for the object. And by comparing this directly to evolutionary tracks, you can then infer a mass. Um, and this kind of work was done quite famously by Stephen Smart in 2009. Um, so this analysis was done for um, a lot of supernovae. I think there's maybe about 20 or so in the sample. Um, and they made all their assumptions and determined the initial masses of all the progenitors um, for the supernovae. Uh, so this is a bit, uh, I, I find this plot a little bit confusing still, um, but basically it's the initial mass along the bottom and it's just ranked uh, as kind of a cumulative thing. Um, and before I said that we see red supergiants up to about 25, 30 solar masses, but this paper suggested that there was actually um, actually, the maximum mass of these type 2 progenitors was more like 16, 17 solar masses. Um, and they claim that these missing red supergiants were evidence for some other weird sort of physics. Um, so as a side note, I'm actually on a few papers about the red supergiant problem. Um, we show that the statistical significance of this uh, is actually super low. I'm not going to go into that too much in this talk, but do feel free to, to ask me about it. Um, but if we go back to evolutionary models for a second now, uh, these are the Geneva models from 2000. And uh, in these models, you can see that the 25 solar mass star um, reaches the red supergiant phase, and that is where it ends its life. So that will produce a type 2 supernovae. Whereas you look at the 40 solar mass star, and that one has a short red supergiant phase, but it comes back out and, and will die somewhere in the, in the hotter region. Um, but the next set of models from the same group look quite a bit different to this. So these are the 2012 Geneva models. Um, and if we now look at the 15 solar mass star, you can see that this one again reaches the red supergiant phase um, and it stays there and dies there. But now the 20 solar mass star reaches the red supergiant phase and then comes right back out of it. So this 20 solar mass star would no longer die as a type two supernovae. Um, and the, the set of models now puts the maximum red supergiant progenitor mass at around uh, somewhere between 15 to 20 solar masses, which is uh, very similar to what was found in the SMART 2009 study. Um, but, you know, what's actually changed between these two models? Um, well, models get updated all the time, so lots of things have changed, uh, including the abundances, how opacities are hand handled, the core overshooting, but quite significantly in this work, the way that mass loss rates were implemented changed quite drastically. 
Um, so mass loss rates uh, aren't calculated from first principles. So for red supergiants in particular, we don't even really know what's driving their mass loss. Um, so evolutionary models require input for this in the form of empirical recipes. So for a given luminosity, there is a given mass loss rate that you can read off. Um, and again, this plot just shows like the different sort of zones of the HR diagram. So everything hotter than uh, 10,000 Kelvin it has its own hot uh, mass loss rate prescriptions, some from Vink and you just Marmers. And then everything below 10,000 Kelvin, there are different mass loss rate prescriptions. So when we get to the cool phase, um, the Geneva models, but also most evolutionary models, use some sort of combination of a couple of mass loss rate prescriptions. So there's the Diaga prescription, which I will describe uh, more soon, and the Van Loon prescription. Um, so that's all pretty standard across most evolutionary models. But in the 2012 Geneva models, um, there was a, an additional uh, step where if the star went five times above the Eddington limit for some uh, slightly uncertain reasons, the mass loss rate was multiplied further by a factor of three. Um, and this factor of three wasn't really informed by observations. It was just an arbitrary number. But it now starts to make a bit more sense why um, the stars above 20 solar masses are no longer exploded in the red supergiant phase. Um, so as I said, we rely on empirical prescriptions and for the cool and the red supergiant phases, there are a lot to choose from. Um, so depending on which prescription you pick, you can see that given luminosity, you could end up with a wildly different uh, mass loss rate. Um, but the most commonly used one is that of Diaga, which I've just highlighted in green. But even if we just consider this one prescription, it has a lot of internal scatter of its own so about a factor of plus minus uh, 10. And just to give you some context, um, this sort of error could be the difference between a star losing um, all of its envelope or losing none of it at all through the red supergiant phase. Um, so I've also overplotted some other mass loss rate observations. There's kind of a lot of scatter there too. Um, and the Van Loon stars, um, which are used, to, are used to inform the other prescription that I mentioned. Um, so this sample was, um, heavily biased because each star was selected because it was highly dust obscured. So it's supposed to be a prescription that's only used for the, the dustiest and these, these sort of dust enshrouded phases. So they deliberately chose uh, stars with high mass loss. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't really be implemented for, for the entirety of the red supergiant phase as it is in, in some uh, stellar models. If we go back to the Diaga rate, um, it wasn't so much a study, it was more a literature search. So the authors, collated luminosity and mass loss rate measurements for 271 stars of all spectral types. Um, and from this derived a mass loss rate luminosity relation. Um, but the sample itself is highly heterogeneous in terms of the stellar masses. So they were just uh, selecting field stars um, and the, the metallicities, so there was no constraint on that either. But it was also really heterogeneous in terms of the methodologies used to to calculate um, the mass loss rates. So some of them came from mid-infrared excesses, others from radio emission. Um, and this prescription is no longer used for hot stars. Um, they've, they've updated their prescriptions. And in, for the red supergiants, there's actually only 15 red supergiants in this, um, in, included in this prescription. So evolutionary models are basing their entire mass loss rate implementation off this tiny sample. Um, and further to this, a lot of the methods are already skewed towards the reddest objects. So a lot of the red supergiants that are included here are famous red supergiants, um, like for example, Vy Canis Majoris, because, which, because they were often chosen as um, observation targets due to their brightness in the mid infrared. Um, and because they're all field stars, this also means that the distances are really uncertain and any luminosity you derive is also gonna be really uncertain. Um, so, I think it was fair to say that this needed a little bit of an update um, and one way to um, improve upon this is to make make the most of red supergiants in clusters. So as I said, one of the major problems with um, the Diaga study is that we didn't know the initial masses of the stars um, and they had really uncertain luminosities, but we can make this better by targeting red supergiants in clusters because if you do this, you can assume that all red supergiants are the same metallicity and the same initial mass to within about one solar mass. Um, and that's because the red supergiant phase is so short. 
so on the right, I have another HR diagram just zoomed in on the red supergiant phase. So um, a star arrives at the red supergiant phase and gets brighter as it evolves towards supernovae. And this means that we can use luminosity as a proxy for the evolution of the star. So you can kind of consider it as um, you're seeing the same star at slightly different stages of evolution. Um, and in the left picture, I have uh, an image of NGC 2100, which is a red supergiant rich cluster. So every bright red thing there is, uh, is a red supergiant. So I think there's 19 red supergiants in there. So even in this one cluster, we already have increased the number of red supergiants compared to the um, Diaga prescription. Uh, so this work uses both archival data, for example, from Spitzer, WISE and MSX, as well as some new data from uh, the SOFIA um, telescope. And the way that we calculate, uh, oh, hang on. So how do we measure mass loss rates? So a red supergiant um, emits its light and the dust around it that's come off from the mass loss rate absorbs and re-emits photons. And we can model this mass loss, we can measure this mass loss rate by modeling the mid-infrared excess. So um, here is a cartoon of what's going on. So the red line is the SED of the star before the light gets processed through the dust and the blue light shows what we actually end up seeing. So some of the light um, gets absorbed by the dust at the shorter wavelengths and then it's re-emitted further down the spectrum and uh, for red supergiants this causes a quite characteristic 10 micron silicate bump. Um, so if there's more dust it means that there's a bigger silicate bump, more mid-infrared excess and you're going to be measuring the higher mass loss rates. Um, but with real data, this is what it actually looks like. Um, so we have photometry around the mid-infrared excess, and then we use um, radiative transfer code DUSTY to model this. Um, you have to make some assumptions to, to do this. So you have to assume a gas to dust ratio. You have to assume a grain size, a density distribution. Um, and we, we assume here a, a steady state wind. Um, but from this, we can derive a mass loss rate for each, each red supergiant. Um, and we derive the luminosities for the red supergiants um, simply by integrating under the observed SED. Um, so the first cluster we did this for was NGC 2100. So we've got luminosity along the bottom and mass loss rate along the y-axis. Um, so what we found was that mass loss rate increased with luminosity which as we've seen is a proxy for, ev a proxy for evolution. Um, so red supergiants arrive at the red supergiant phase with little to no dust, which is why there's upper limits down there. Um, and then this dust shell builds up throughout the phase. So um, here we have initial mass and metallicity fixed, and you can see the relations um, looking pretty tight. Um, and that's fine if we only wanna look at red supergiants at, at one initial mass. So these are, um, I think, uh, 15 solar masses or something like that. Um, if the scatter in the previous relations is, is due to a constraint on initial mass, then we need to look at more clusters. So uh, we, look at, uh, we look at more clusters with a range of ages and hence um, red supergiants of initial masses. So we've got a few galactic and a few LMC clusters in there. Um, so we repeated the study, getting mass loss rates and luminosities for all of these objects. Um, and again, this is another luminosity mass loss rate plot. Um, and it looks a little bit of a mess there, but what we found was that the, the mass loss rate luminosity relation had the same gradient within the errors. So we very simply fixed that. Um, and the gradient has been fixed to the average of all the gradients. And what it turns out is that the offset of the relation increases with the initial mass. Um, so the red triangles are RSGC1, those clusters are about 10, that cluster is about 10 mega years. Um, so they're about 20 to 25 solar masses. And then we have uh, the other clusters, which are all sort of around 20 mega years old. And Emma, Emma was the metallicity the same in all these clusters or is that different? Yes, NGC 2100 is an LMC cluster. The other ones are all galactic. Okay, thank you. No worries. Um, so from this, we were able to derive a, an initial mass dependent mass loss rate prescription, which can be put into evolutionary models. So um, the important thing to do is to see how our prescription performed. So um, these, this part shows the residual. So our 
um, actual directly measured mass loss rates for each star compared to what we would get using our prescription. Um, so the left-hand plot shows the results for ours, um, and you can see the RMS is about 0.45, so um, it's a little bit tighter than the Diago one. Um, and there's obviously no offset here because that's what we calibrated the prescription to. Um, and if you look at the Diaga prescription, at first it doesn't look too bad. The RMS is slightly bigger. Um, the average offset is only about 0.13. But the important thing to look at here is the highest luminosity and hence the highest initial mass objects, where the offset is actually much higher, in fact, um, at 1.4 dex. Um, and this is important because these are the objects where the, the fate is the most unknown. It's the highest mass red supergiants where we don't really know how they're going to end their lives. So if you're overestimating their, their mass loss rates, um, you're not going to be able to make predictions about, about where they should where they should end their lives on the HR diagram. Um, so to put this into perspective, um, if we compare to how um, mass loss rate is currently implemented in the Geneva models, um, this plot shows time after leaving the main sequence against the current mass of the star. So the Geneva models for a 20 solar mass star predict that it will lose 10 solar masses of material um, after the main sequence. And losing this 10 solar masses of material is what's forcing um, the, the red supergiant to end its life in, in the blue of the HR diagram. Um, so what we did was we just simply recalculated mass loss using our prescription at each time step. Um, this wasn't a rerun of the models, this was just a, a, a basic calculation. Um, but from our observations, what we found was that a 20 solar mass star would actually only end up losing about one solar mass of material through this time. Um, and this would not be enough to cause that bluewood, um, bluewood evolution. Um, so what we can say here is that the quiescent mass loss through the red supergiant phase is not enough to remove the hydrogen envelope. Sorry, just to um, unpack, it's kind of a hard plot there. So um, the red is like a 15 solar mass initial star. Is it yeah. initial or is it just when it enters the red the giant phase, I guess? The initial mass. So uh, you can see that they don't lose much mass through the main sequence um, at all. But yes, yeah, so that's the 15 solar mass initial mass star. And each of these, these are run up to core collapse on the far right. Is that correct? This is to the end of where the Geneva models run to. So I think it's up to carbon burning or something. OK. So is it possible that there's much more mass loss after that? Or is it time so, so, so short that this is really the phase that we should be focusing on? Um, I will get to more on that. But yeah, so okay. um, yeah, so the quiescent mass loss is really low. And I will talk in a little bit about potential higher mass loss phases. OK, so thank you. No worries. Um, OK, uh, yeah, so crescent mass loss was low, but this was just a sort of simple calculation following the Geneva tracks. Um, so the next step was to input this new mass loss rate prescription into the evolutionary code MESA. Um, so we performed a comparative study to the missed stellar isochrones. So the only parameter we changed here was um, the mass loss rate prescription. Um, so the missed models used uh, use the Diaga prescription just as it is. They didn't do any um, increasing of the of the mass loss rates. They just use it pretty much um, directly out of the box. Um, and what you can see is that there's clearly no change in the basic endpoint of the of the objects. Um, so neither neither our models or the original MIST models predict that any of these stars will evolve back to the blue. So uh, we looked at a mass range of 12 to around 27 solar masses. Um, which is where our prescription is, is calibrated to. But yeah, so none of these, neither set of these models will produce um, uh, any wolf ray stars in this mass range. And since above this kind of mass range, uh, the binary fraction increases so much, it may be that this is sort of ruling out a single star pathway for forming wolf rays or stripped stars. Um, but one thing did change. So the well, a couple of things changed. So the initial final mass relation uh, clearly changed. So the this figure shows, um, yeah, the initial mass versus the final mass, and the blue triangles show what's predicted from the missed models using the Diaga prescription. And you can see there is this plateau in the final mass of the star, and that is because of the Diaga prescription um, massively over predicting 
the mass loss rate for the highest luminosity and hence the highest initial mass objects, whereas we see a direct correlation between the initial and the final mass. Um, and this might seem really obvious, but lower mass loss rates mean that there is more hydrogen envelope left at core collapse. So the MIST models again predict a plateau here um, because of how strong the Diaga prescription is. Um, so whereas we find a direct um, correlation between the initial mass and the hydrogen envelope mass at core collapse. Um, so most models of supernova progenitors have used the Diaga prescription to inform their models. But no matter what initial mass of star you have, all of the models are basically exploding with pretty much the same envelope mass. Um, whereas we see a direct, we predict a direct correlation. Um, and this sort of opens the door to maybe if um, you explode a massive star with a higher envelope mass, there might be some signature that we've just, we've just missed or haven't predicted before. Um, and it could potentially be a useful method of determining initial mass, but obviously I have not done this yet or looked into it, but the, the potential is there. Um, and if there is a short burst of mass loss right at the end of um, end of the life of these objects, then this, this could exist, but if it was, it would have to be really quick and you'll see why in a minute. Um, and so the material probably wouldn't have enough time to move away from the star and a nearby dense shell would um, probably cause the star to look more like a 2N or like a narrow line supernovae than a, than a 2P. You would see a lot of interaction. Um, so I always get asked about higher mass loss rate phases. So the mass loss rates we derive aren't instantaneous. Um, the warm dust that we're looking at samples probably the last sort of 100 or so years of, um, of, of mass loss history. And because we're watching the star evolve, we can sort of see how the mass loss rate changes. But if there was like a really high mass loss phase, um, it would have to last around 10 to the four years um, to make, to remove the amount of mass that, that would be needed to get these stars to go over to the blue. Um, so if this was happening, then we would expect around 10% of red supergiants to be currently undergoing mass loss rates of more than 10 to the minus four. So some studies do claim that there is um, a short-lived high mass loss rate phase. So I mentioned before that the Geneva models also use uh, the Van Loon mass loss rate prescription. Um, so this prescription is based on a sample of dust enshrouded stars, both AGB and red supergiant in the LMC. Um, and I think there's 17 of them. Um, and it's been argued that these dusty stars represent uh, this short-lived high mass loss rate phase that maybe all single star red supergiants pass through. Um, and this would get us out of the all wolf ray stars need to come from binary star, uh, binary scenario. But if you look at the, um, the dust and shrouded red supergiants just in color magnitude space, you can see that they don't really stand out as a distinct group. So on the bottom, we have um, K minus Y is three, which is sort of the near infrared minus the mid infrared color. So that should um, be a pretty good lever to, to trace any, any dust that's around the star against luminosity. Um, so the black dots represent all of the cool supergiants in the in the LMC, and the stars are the objects that are also included in in the Van Loon study. Um, and out of all of these stars, we find one sort of bona fide dust and shrouded red supergiant, which is Wo G64, which has a really high mass loss rate, higher than ten to the minus four. Um, the rest of them don't really have mass loss rates that high. Um, another weird object is that one on the right, it's LILMC1100. And if you look at the SED for this object, it, it just it just looks like dust. So we don't even really know if it's a red supergiant. Um, we're actually trying to get more data to look at it. Um, so it could be it could be a dusty star or it could just be a, a blob of, of stuff or even like an embedded proto star. We really just don't know what's going on with that. Um, so only one star out of all of the, the red supergiants in the LMC um, can be considered to be a true dust and shrouded red supergiant. So if the red supergiant lifetime is around 10 to the six years, then only a really small number, like one, one to 2% of its life is spent in this high M dot phase. 
Um, so this again would only allow maybe like one to two solar masses of material to be lost. Um, so what does this mean in sort of the, the bigger picture? Well, around uh, a third of, of supernovae are hydrogen poor. Um, and just doing a little back of the envelope IMF calculation, um, about 85% of stars are between eight to 30 solar masses and only about 15% of stars are above 30 solar masses. So you can see there's a discrepancy there between the stars that you would expect to form hydrogen poor supernovae um, and the stars which, which we actually see. Um, if we had the higher mass loss rates, then, and the upper limit to red supergiant progenitors was around 16, 17 solar masses, the numbers would kind of make a bit more sense. You'd have about 40% of all stars being above 16 solar masses. Um, but what we actually see is that the mass loss rates are, are too low. Um, so this would actually send the problem the other way. We'd end up with even fewer hydrogen poor supernovae from single stars. So what we can say here is that single star evolution um, simply cannot explain the observed supernova rate. Um, and this is strong evidence that for most hydrogen poor supernovae um, or even more greys being the product of binary interaction. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so another implication of this work is the Humphreys, looking at the Humphreys-Davidson limit. So uh, the Humphreys-Davidson limit is the maximum luminosity that cool supergiants can have. Um, it was derived uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think the, the, the upper limit is around five, we think it's around 5.5 now. Um, so the, the Humphreys-Davidson limit, this maximum luminosity for core supergiants clearly isn't being driven by the cool supergiant winds. Um, so this puts extra emphasis on the hot phases of stellar evolution. Um, and winds that are taking place in the, in the hot phases are strongly metallicity dependent. So, um, but the, and the mass loss rates, but the mass loss rates are coming down there as well. But we should still expect to see some sort of metallicity dependence to the Humphreys-Davidson limit if it is winds that are driving it. So um, in the LMC and the SMC, what we find is that the upper limit is around 5.5. Um, so this was our 2018 paper. So even in that small sort of metallicity range, we can see that um, that doesn't look metallicity dependent. And um, a student, uh, Sarah McDonald, is currently looking at M31 red supergiants, and she also finds that the LMAX is 5.5. So that is a higher metallicity. I think it's um, above solar or super solar. Um, so we can see that it's not metallicity dependent. Uh, so that is kind of the end of the main bit of my talk. So um, there's, the summary points are that there's no observationally motivated reason to increase mass loss rates by these factors of three or more in stellar evolutionary models. Um, any red supergiant that does evolve as a single star doesn't shed its envelope via quiescent winds, and therefore mass loss is probably not driving the Humphreys-Davidson limit. Um, single stars between 20 to 30 solar masses are not losing enough mass to evolve blueward, um, and the relative number of stripped and stripped supernovae events um, predicted by single star models must be way off. Uh, and then finally, just the, if there is a correlation of envelope mass with initial mass, then any uh, looking into this, there might be new constraints on the initial mass of supernovae from, from supernova light curves. Um, yeah, I don't know how long I have really. If there, if there is like 10 minutes or so, I can talk about something else for a bit. <laughs> But, yeah, right. please continue, Emma. Don't worry, you have um, 25 more, 20 more minutes, maybe? So okay, great. 15, 20 minutes. All right, well, I'll take a different, uh, I'll take a different route then. So I will talk about um, the interesting cluster Westerlin 1. Um, so Westerlin 1 is a young cluster in the Milky Way um, that was first discovered in 1961. So it's a very young, highly extinguished cluster. Um, and it was thought to be the nearest massive starburst. Um, so it's the only one where you can evolve all of the individual stars. Um, so for example, here's what a high redshift starburst galaxy normally looks like. Um, so you can't see anything specific, obviously, 
um, and models of massive stellar evolution are fundamental to studying these distant starbursts, but the only starburst they can kind of be directly tested against is Westerland 1. Um, and this cluster has extreme stellar diversity, including four red supergiants, six yellow supergiants, and there's a magnetar, there's loads of wolf ray stars, um, and there's, there's quite literally no other cluster like this. Um, and all of this diversity within Westerland 1 has meant that it's been seen as a kind of Rosetta Stone type object for massive stellar evolution. So people often join the dots on the HR diagram here and use this to say that this is um, which stars pass through, pass through which phases and how long each of these phases should last. Um, but stellar models can only explain um, this diversity and hence the total brightness, the colours of the cluster, the ionising flux, if it's around five mega years old. Um, in particular, the difficult thing to match is the red supergiant to um, the wolf ray ratio. It's super hard for these things to coexist because wolf rays have such short lifetimes, but five mega years from single star models uh, seems, seems to work. You seem to be able to have them existing at the same time. Um, so yeah, the first paper that kind of looked in detail at it was Clark in 2005. And the, yeah, the stellar diversity was used to justify uh, saying it's probably an age of five mega years. And this would imply the progenitor population um, have initial masses above 30. Um, and this would mean that the total cluster mass was around 10 to the five solar masses, which would make Westerland 1 the, the most massive galactic cluster that we know. Um, but if it is really only five mega years, then we have a good model prediction of how bright the stars within it should be. Um, it's hard to use the wolf rays for this because all of the flux comes out in the UV, but you can do it for the, the cool supergiants. Um, so yeah, this at this age, um, the red and the yellow supergiants should be really, really luminous. They should be right up there at the Humphreys-Davidson limit. Um, with initial masses between 30 to maybe even, maybe even 35 solar masses. But it's been really difficult to get uh, bolometric luminosities for these objects because the, the infrared data available was just really saturated because of how near and how bright the, the cluster is. Um, so there's some bits of data on the left and some wise data on the right, and you can see you just can't see, can't see what's going on at all. Um, but we got observations of Westerland 1 using Sophia forecast. Um, so we observed it between around 5 microns to 31 microns and four wave bands. And you can see we've got a nice mid-infrared image there. Um, so the, the red circles are the, are the red supergiants. So there's four of them. Um, and using the red supergiants, we already have some data um, in the, in the shorter wave bands, so we can construct SEDs. Um, and you, to get a good luminosity, all you need to do is integrate under the SED um, and take into account things like extinction um, and the distance. And um, we had an updated distance from Gaia DR2 to the cluster. Um, and doing this for all of the red supergiants, you can determine a pretty, a pretty, good, um, a pretty good luminosity. So we did this for all of the red and the yellow supergiants actually, um, and put it onto a HR diagram. Uh, there are isochrones on there, but they're really faint, so sorry about that. Um, but you can see the, we've got the red and the yellow supergiants on the right, and then we've got all the wolf rays on the left. Um, the star is, is an LBV. So if the cluster was five mega years, this is what the isochrone predicts that the red and the yellow supergiants should be. Um, and you can see that they are far um, fainter than that. Um, so an age of five mega years doesn't really make sense when you look at the, at the red supergiant and the yellow supergiant population. Um, so in a 2018 paper, we uh, showed that you can use red supergiants as an age estimator for, um, for clusters, and this should be robust to effects such as stellar rotation and binarity. So this plot shows um, uh, we had a simulated uh, synthetic cluster, um, and we worked out the age of the cluster um, a whole load of times using both the main sequence turnoff and by using the least luminous uh, red supergiant. Um, so you can see that the true age of the cluster here is 20 mega years, 
um, and the turnoff method underestimated the the um, the age even for just the single stars by around four four mega years, whereas the red supergiant method gets gets much closer. So if we use this method to calculate an age for Westerland one, we find an age of 11 plus minus three mega years. And more than that, we can actually exclude an age of less than seven mega years um, at the 99.2% confidence level. Um, and if you look at models that include binarity, then you can kind of start to make sense of what's going on. So in the left-hand plot, these are um, stellar population models from the BPAS models. Um, the left-hand plot is uh, five, a five mega year cluster, and you can see that the there's only a tiny point where the red and the yellow supergiants are, and it's too bright, but it does a pretty good job of matching the, the wolf rays. Um, whereas you look at a 10 mega year cluster, and there's like one wolf ray that's too bright there, but the red and the yellow supergiants kind of make a bit more sense. That's including some uh, binaries. Um, another way of getting an age is to look at the pre-main sequence. Um, so this is the pre-main sequence. Uh, this is one, one way that the pre-main sequence was used. Um, so there's actually been a series of papers by this group where they where they estimate the age. And they always seem to come out with ages of around um, four, four to five uh, mega years. So we looked into this um, uh, in, our, in our paper that shouldn't say submitted. Um, and what we found was that when you're fitting the, the pre-main sequence, you're really, really sensitive to these four stars here. Um, so if you, if you include these four stars, then, um, then it does, it does like really significantly affect the age that you derive. Um, if you assume even like one of those stars is a binary, then it pulls the age like to older ages. Or if you assume one is like, um, you know, hidden behind dust or extra dusty, um, it just all depends on these four stars. You can basically get any age depending on if you assume they're single stars or if you take into account that there could be binaries in there or that they could be like blended sources, or even if one of them is like a foreground star. Um, so the red and the yellow supergiants clearly indicate an older age than, you know, all these previous studies have found. Um, so what, what could, what could reconcile this? So it could be that there is a really high binary fraction in the cluster. Um, it's been suggested that it could be above 70%. I've, I read one paper that said it could even be close to a hundred percent. Um, there could be an age spread in the cluster. It would have to be around seven mega years, but you know, it could be something like this. Um, or it could be that Western one is actually like an extended star forming region, similar to G305 or Danks one and two. Um, but whatever the reason, um, it's clear that Western one is likely older than five mega years. And the presence of this older and lower mass population means that Western one status as one of the most massive clusters in the local group um, probably needs to be revisited. Um, and yeah, I think I will stop there. Thank you so much, Emma. Let's give a little applause. Um, so this is really interesting. And um, of course I have some questions, but I wanted to ask also the audience, so you can put up your hand. Um, if you want to ask a question. And while you're thinking about it, um, I can start. So I wanted to ask Emma, uh, you created this new mass loss prescription by carefully uh, observing these red supergiants. Would you dare to extrapolate that and say something about how high mass black holes you can create in say uh, Milky Way metallicity or so? You mean, you mean how to, like if I extrapolated to higher initial masses? Higher masses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that is something that I'm 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 gonna do. So the the prescription is only calibrated to um, the highest mass objects here, which was like twenty five. But I am gonna try and run a set of models like between thirty to maybe like fifty, and also turn down the um, the hot star mass loss rates in line with like the Bjorklund and the Sunquist papers. Um, and I think what it's going to show is that if you just evolve these stars as single stars, then 
um, they're not going to turn back and form more phrase if you turn the mass loss rates down. So there just must be way more. I mean, it's all just probably binaries, right? Right. Yeah, that's interesting. It would it would be interesting to see. And of course, I mean, it's hard to measure the mass loss rates of those really luminous objects. Yeah. Maybe yeah. there are not that many, but it would be it would be interesting to see what happens when if you go even higher mass. Um, yeah. yeah. There's just not that many uh, yeah. high mass red supertractors <laughs> that we thought were still in one, but now it looks uh, like it's, it's older as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see. Tony. I guess my question was kind of related to what you were just asking. Um, uh, you know, what's the most massive star that you have in it, these open cluster studies? Was it 25 or can you get up to 30 or not? It, it's 25 with RSGC ones. So that's used. Obviously, it's like slightly um model dependent but it's around 25. okay yeah and then i guess my I, my one additional question was th this older age for western than one does that have any implications for our understanding of the magnetar there the magnetar is presumably ten thousand years or less i don't know does it have a supernova remnant associated with it i don't remember yes yeah, so i think the magnetar age is um is pretty solid i think that is uh, I think that probably is one of the objects. So there's a couple of, so there's the, that is probably around five to 10 mega years. It's hard to put like precise age on it, but we're not saying that like nothing in the, in the, it, it's hard because we're not saying that like the cluster is 10 mega years and everything is older. Like if there is an age spread, then it's still really hard to tie down. Cause I think the magnetar mass is like partly based off this five mega year um, thing. So it's it's hard to say. Yeah, because as the magnetar is less than ten thousand years old, mm. you would say that it potentially came from a lower mass progenitor, yeah. you know, than maybe people would have guessed before. Yeah. So if there is, you know, if it is that the whole cluster is older and there are just loads of binaries going on, then yeah, I agree. Like, but I think it it could be that there, there's an age spread. It's just it's really hard to to tell like we even like floated the idea that maybe there's like two clusters and like just like lined up in front of each other and we're just seeing two completely different populations but it's just super hard to to show that right okay thank you no problem francois hi thank you for a great talk very interesting uh, i have a little comment in one question the comment is you said westerlund one with 10 to the five solar masses is the most massive known cluster. I assume you, in this speaking, do not count the global clusters as clusters. Yeah. Uh, they are the most massive clusters, five times 10 to the six, Omega Centauri, four, five times two to the six. So we are talking of a Westerlund that's only 2% the mass of the most massive global clusters. Do you have any idea why young clusters or recently formed clusters, even within the last giga year, do not reach close to the global cluster masses. Um, yeah, so I should have been more clear. It's the most massive, young, massive cluster. Um, I'm not entirely sure, actually. That's a good question. I've just not thought about it. It's probably, just to do, I don't know, actually, probably to do with the IMF, probably accreting stuff as well. I don't know. If I had to guess, it would be that the current star formation environment is much less violent, which means less compressing massive uh, molecule, giant molecular cloud, but I don't know. Rensa, we have a new Hubble fellow, Mike Rudich, who does some star formation models. So he's not, I don't see him here, but you might want to reach out to him. You might have some answers about that. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, so I can ask another question that I have, Emma. Mm -hmm. um, so in the study of Westerlund one, the Wolfraya stars, they, they seem to be too bright almost for like any of the um, of the populations you compare it to. Uh, do you think that that can have to do with how the how the luminosities were inferred from these stars? Would you see like when you take a spectrum or photometry, it's just the radio gene, radio gene's tail of the SCD? Yes. It could be like, I don't know too much about how they get these wolf ray things. I know it's like quite model dependent. Um, mm -hmm. So I can't remember who I was speaking to about it, but I think depending on how you treat the models, like the, the luminosities can come down a bit, but 
yeah, I really don't know too much about that. I would say that that's possible though. They could just be that the it's it's just really hard to get a luminosity out of a wolf ray, right? Because it's right. so much flux is lost at the short well comes out at the shorter wavelengths. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because if they are created to binary interaction, um, they should have similar similar age, right? As the mm -hmm. red supergiants should have similar luminosities. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so it's 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 an interesting study. Okay, well, do we have any any more questions? If not, then let's thank Emma again. And uh, maybe Emma, if you have the opportunity to put on the video. Yay, nice. Um, and uh, let's have a look. So I haven't checked your schedule today, but the, um, yesterday there were still some slots. So have a look, people, and sign up to talk with Emma. I'm sure it will be fun. Um, so with that, thank you so much, Emma. Really appreciate. Okay, and I will stop the recording.